I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I know that there's a lot that's going on in the town. You hear about it from uh, many different sources. Um, and I'd rather it come from the source uh, than the sources such as social media and word of mouth. Uh, anybody, and social media is nothing more than a glorified word of mouth because basically everybody is just giving you their thoughts and, and it doesn't allow for interchange of ideas and, and the background behind how we got to where we are. As this is uh, Jim Wendell, he's one of our councilmen and he's also the director of the um, East Brunswick uh, Redevelopment Agency. So the work that we'll be talking about today is not something that I'm doing myself. This is something that's being done with the entire Township Council aware of it, the Redevelopment Agency aware of it, Redevelopment Advisor Committee, which are those individuals in town that have helped give us background information and have helped us with our uh, in looking at our plans and so that they can be tailored to the things that those of us in town are looking for. So with that said, when I normally do these uh, town halls, I always start out with just a little bit of news for the town because there are new things that are going on besides just redevelopment. So I, I do want to touch on that. Uh, first uh, and foremost, at the end of this month, we will be um, meeting uh, and you don't have to go very far to meet him, uh, a brand new chief of police for our township, Jim uh, James Conroy, is retiring effective the end of this month. And the new chief is Lieutenant Frank Lasacco, who is directly behind you. Uh, with, uh, seems it's one of these generational things. It seems for, uh, for one reason or another, we had a lot of officers that signed on uh, in 1994 and they have all reached their 25 year mark this year. So as a result, there's about five or six, maybe possibly up to eight retirements. And when that happens at the top level of the police force, it means that there's gonna be a whole flurry of individuals who will be moving up in rank. Privates becoming, uh, uh, patrolmen becoming sergeants, sergeants becoming lieutenants, lieutenants becoming captains. So we will be having <clears throat> a ceremony in honor of all of those promotions. That's going to be at the uh, JM PAC, the Joanne Magestro Performing Arts Center at Hammershold. Uh, that's going to be on July, 34, uh, July 31st. It's a Wednesday, Wednesday, right? At 6 o'clock at night. So um, all of those officers, their families, and the entire town is really welcome to, to show up and watch that. It's a really big event. And frankly, it's really one, one time in a generation that you'll see that many people moving up at one time. So I think it is a great thing for the town. The um, other thing I wanted to mention is that we are performing on a plays under the park, similar to what plays in the park is in Edison. We're calling it Summer Stage Under the Stars. The end of this month, the last Thursday, Friday, Saturday, which is the 25th, 26th, and 27th, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and then the following Thursday, Friday, Saturday in August. And it's our attempt at using our Performing Arts Center <clears throat> to do exactly what they do with plays in the park and be able to provide night theater for people outdoors. So bring your uh, lounge chairs. It's going to be the same $7 ticket price that they do at plays in the park. We'll have uh, outdoor uh, food vendors so we can make an evening of it. And, so, and, and, and as opposed to plays in the park, this you can actually purchase your ticket online ahead of time. Uh, but you do need to go to the uh, uh, community arts center and get your, your spot. That you have to come on your own. So we're hoping that that's going to be successful. If we have the theater, we invested in the sound system and the lighting system. Uh, that's already been put in place. So I really think it's going to be a great opportunity for us to showcase the arts right here in, in East Brunswick. So um, but with that said, uh, we also have 4th of July coming up on Thursday. Uh, festivities all sponsored by the Parks and Recreation Department starts at 4 o'clock. And it continues all the way until the evening when we have our annual fireworks ceremony. Um, uh, in the last two years, I've only gotten one letter of somebody complaining about the line getting out of fireworks on 4th of July. Um, folks, there's 10,000 people that show up at that. There's only two exits and everyone leaves at the same time. So if uh, you don't want to wait getting out of the parking lot, then either don't come or park outside or, or take Uber. I don't care, but, but I can't do anything about 
the traffic. It's different for many other things that we have at the uh, at the community arts center, such as East Brunswick Day and and the summer uh, spring fest, where people come at different times and leave at different times. But with Fourth of July, everybody leaves at once. So nothing I could do. Um, Anyway, what I do want to spend the most of the time talking tonight about is about redevelopment and what we've done here in town, where we are, and how we got here. Um, I think if I were to dial back for those of you who have not heard me speak on this before, redevelopment here in East Brunswick dates actually back to 2015 when under Mayor Stahl, he recognized that a lot of the retail that was existing on Route 18 was falling either into disrepair or many of them were just leaving, leaving the places empty. And as a result of empty stores, a lot of the stores uh, turned into uh, bl blighted conditions where um, owners were really not even taking care of their property. And as a result, um, he felt that the only way to try to get that to turn around is to try to utilize redevelopment laws that have been put on the books in New Jersey as a way of incentivizing uh, either developers who have or owners who have no interest in doing something with their property or would like some sort of tax benefit um, incentive to try to invest in their property to make that worthwhile. Uh, and that was uh, redevelopment started in 2015. And he declared the areas from the Turnpike exit of Route 9, uh, of exit 9, all the way to West Ferris Road as areas of need and redevelopment. And he did that without the right to take property. When you call an area an area of need or redevelopment, you have to decide from day one, are you doing it with the right to condemn or without the right to condemn? He thought in 2015, um, I'm not trying to read his mind, but his thoughts, most of the thoughts at that time was that those buildings were not in that bad of disrepair and that if we gave uh, some tax advantages to those owners, they would invest it in their property and, 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 and turn it around and, and make the type of, of uh, investment that we thought would turn it around. That obviously did not happen. More and more businesses left that corridor uh, and it became even more vacant. And, um, and so we were left with the situation of what are we gonna do about that? And I think if you think about what do you wanna do about that, you have to understand or I would like you to understand that there is a cost to doing nothing. There's a cost to doing nothing. Right now, the area where Lomans and where the gap in the Wiz uh, presently used to exist brings the town about $1.5 million in taxes. That's what they're charged. The uh, area on 110 Tices where the old Wonder Bread factory used to be uh, is taxed at about a half a million. So between the two properties, we get about $2 million a year in taxable, rateable income to the town. That goes into the tax base. As you, if you look at the whole town, roughly 80% of our taxes come from residential property taxes, like you and I pay. Um, and maybe 15% comes from those uh, retail businesses and about 5% from industrial sources. So the vast majority of expenses that the town incurs are being supported by the property taxes that we pay on our homes. If you do nothing with those properties, those properties are billed on net operating income. So if a building is 100% occupied, which is how they are being taxed right now, this is how they're they, this is how their tax rate is determined. But we all know that for the last five to 10 years, none of those buildings have been 100% occupied. And as a result, every single one of them have tax appeals into the town, which they will win, because if it's based on net operating income, they have a very easy way of proving that they're not making the same income because they're not rented out 100%. And they, so the only thing to be determined is how much money they're gonna get back and how many years we're gonna go back and, and award it. When the town awards a, uh, a settlement, that is borne 100% by the township. We can't go back to the schools and say, oh, 65% of the taxes uh, went to the schools, which is how it's determined if you look at your tax bill, and 20% went to the county, so we're gonna give them a million dollars, I want 650 back from you and 200 back, no. The town has to pay that bill 100%. So if we are stuck paying that bill, 
then what, and our expenses are even the same, even if they didn't go up, what do you think is going to happen to your property taxes? That, that there's it's math. That's the only option is for me to raise taxes because the expenses are not, unless I cut staff 20, 30 percent, which isn't going to happen. So the reality is there's a cost to doing nothing, and we can't let that be. So that was the impetus behind doing something with these properties. They need to start being developed into something that can provide the type of return to the town that can really help offset the burden that's placed on property owners in their own homes uh, and in your own property taxes. So that's where we decided, you know, these guys have not really done anything with their property. We're going to reverse, go back, do the whole redevelopment idea with the idea that you can take property if we have non-compliant or recalcitrant people who really don't want to do anything with their properties because the town is acting in the interest of the residents that live here to try to do something about your taxes and to provide the type of tax base that we need uh, so that taxes don't keep rising out of control for property owners. <clears throat> and at the same time, we recognize that uh, there are demographic changes that have taken place in East Brunswick over the last 20, 30 years. If you look at statistics, the largest age group um, based on the 2000 uh, census living here in East Brunswick were those people that, that are aged 35 to 45. By the time 2010 census was uh, determined, which usually comes a couple years later when those results come out, the largest age group in East Brunswick was 45 to 55. If that trend keeps happening, then we are a town in decline. We are getting older, not that that's a terrible thing, but you're not bringing anybody in at the lower end who utilize the schools, who utilize the, um, the fact that we're centrally located, who utilize the fact that we are, uh, have all this wonderful culture and diversity here. Um, those people will be going elsewhere and we can't afford to be a town. I wanna to turn our backs on people who've been here for a long time, but we can't be so isolated that we're not letting new people move in because that's where you get, again, a, a uh, influx of people who um, bring new ideas, new uh, diversity to the town, and utilize the schools, which is your number one selling feature. When people move to East Brunswick, and by the way, for all the whining and complaining on Facebook where people say how they're gonna leave, this is getting a horrible town, I, you know what, let me help them pack, because there are real estate agents that, that love to sell East Brunswick. They will sell your house in a second. If you hate it here that much, please don't stay. There are other people who are more than happy to move here. We have great schools. They still remain great schools. We have a culturally diverse community, which is a plus. We have incredibly safe community, and we still are blessed with an incredible location. That hasn't changed. And and we have a great live, which we're standing in right now. So I think that um, realtors recognize that. And, and so for all the whining and complaining, um, the, the reality is that they are, would be more than happy. Uh, houses don't stay on the market in East Brunswick very long. So with all that said, I think we need to understand how we got here. Layered on top of all of this is the fact that the state of New Jersey is expensive to live in. We know that. It has, it's between taxes and the cost of living here. It's just high. And as a result, the state recognizes that we can't continue to lose people to other states because it's so expensive to live here. So not only East Brunswick, not only New Jersey, but the entire tri-state area has affordable housing obligations that we need to meet in order to attract people to live here in an affordable way. Affordable housing is not Section 8 housing. Every time we bring that up, we have people, oh my God, I don't want them living here. I, I don't know what them is, but affordable housing is really your starting teachers, your starting cops, the, the, uh, the uh, technician that works in my office who's making forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, that just doesn't get you much in New Jersey. You really can't get by on that. And so the uh, housing costs have to be supplemented. Try to keep people living here. Affordable housing rules actually have 
gradations in, in, uh, and limits on what you can make in order for you to uh, qualify for an affordable unit. But these are working people. These are individuals who eventually get married. They'll move up the, the, the scale in where they're working, and, and they will move into something nicer in that room, and that apartment will be made available to someone else who's starting out. It's, it's, it's uh, our version of, say, workforce housing, where we allow people who, um, who really are looking for an opportunity here. And in, in, in East Brunswick, based on our region, you qualify for an affordable housing, making an income of under $65,000 a year. And, 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 and as an example, if you were living in San Francisco, which is the most expensive city, in, uh, it's actually more expensive than New York, you actually qualify for an affordable unit with an income of $115,000 a year because people realize that you can't find anything in San Francisco with an income of $115,000 a year. So it's all regional, but for our region, I just need to get out of people's minds that affordable housing means um, Section 8 housing, it's not that. But our town was given an obligation like every town in all of New Jersey back in 2015 that we had to provide 315 units between now and 2025. Folks, compared to many other towns, that's not a huge obligation. And in 2016, the town, before I took office, the town came up with a settlement with the courts on how they were going to count for 315 units. 115 were going to be in the redevelopment areas we're talking about today, and 200 were going to be divided uh, within the rest of the town. And that's done because you can't isolate affordable housing to a particular region. It looks like you're segregating people with lower incomes to a part of the town and everyone else can live somewhere else. The goal of all of this is to integrate people into the community. So the court would never have allowed us to say that we want all 315 on the redevelopment areas because those are the areas that are in the most need of repair. They wouldn't have allowed it. So, most of you have heard about developments that were uh, because of that settlement and many other towns who've settled also you hear about developers that are want to come into town and do development because they want to build and i think many of them also recognize that the market isn't going to be good forever it's destined for a correction and so they're all rushing to go building and so all you hear about on the news this one wants to build at hd summerhill this one wants to build at Aiden oaks this one wants to build the ferris farms this one wants to build on route 18 this one wants to be and all you're hearing about is building but you need to differentiate development from redevelopment redevelopment is designed specifically in the areas of town where properties have fallen into greatest disrepair and where most of us agree that if we leave it the way it is it's going to be a detriment to the town and that i don't believe although not a hundred percent um, most people have an issue with redeveloping those areas. The problem areas are the areas like H.D. Summerhill and all these other areas in the rest of the town where people want to park developments in the back of developments that are already there. And that's where we've heard a lot of controversy and discussion. Those settlements were made. Um, some of them have plans that the town's planning board or zoning board were able to agree with. Some of them we weren't. Um, but at the end of the day, we need to meet that obligation. And, and, and so whether you like it or you don't like it or you don't want this in your backyard, I, I get all of that, um, but it's not anything that's being driven within East Brunswick. This is being driven by the state. It's being driven by particularly the courts because the courts took it over from the legislature because the legislature wasn't acting on it. And now we have to deal with a court imposed decision on where that housing is going to be and the township did the best it can to comply if it didn't comply it runs the risk of happening to east brunswick which with what happened to south brunswick their number was 750 double r's they went back to court to contest it because they felt that that was unfair stupid move on their part i think because they were going back to the same judge that decided that 750 was the right number and lo and behold the judge disagreed with them that he felt he was right in the first place and as a result now doubled it now they have to build 1500. so you know we're just going to take our 300 and we're going to do what we need to and comply with the court 
and we will be done with that obligation and we won't have to worry about it till 2025. But that's the reason why you're hearing about all these uh, developments. And a developer isn't going to build just affordable units. They, they lose money on that. So when a developer is told that they're going to build 100 units, that, that, that roughly is 20% of their total. They're allowed to make money on the 80% that are full price units. You can't ask somebody to build only something that they're going to lose money on. So the legislature, the state allows the developers to build something and set aside 20% towards that affordable obligation. So if our town has 300 units that need to be built, that means that the court has just allowed 1,500 units to be built in the town because 20% of 1,500 is the 300. The builder is allowed to build full price units 80%. That's the law. Um, South Brunswick, think about that. If they have to build 1,500 units now, that means that the court has just allowed 7,500 units in that town because 20% of 7,500 is 1,500. And if that's the case and there's an average of two people per unit that move in, you've just increased the township's population by 15,000. It's only 42 to begin with. So just think about how devastating these numbers could be if we want to fight the court and go back to try to overturn those decisions. So the whining, the complaining, the I don't want it in my backyard, I get all of that. What do you want us to do? As far as redevelopment, that's really what I want to concentrate on. Redevelopment is a different bird to me than developing in the back of areas that already have development because we've already decided that they need work and they need investment and we need to turn them around into something that brings money into our tax base. So the areas we've been concentrating on and what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of the time until we open it up to questions are the three areas that we've been working on primarily. And the, the first one's the easiest. That's 39 Edgeboro. That's off of Edgeboro Road next to the landfill. It's an area that's already designated for uh, industrial purposes. There was a building there that was previously being used for, I forget Herbert what the, Sand. for what? It was Herbert Sand. Oh, the, the sand company? Yeah. It's um, sand pits right next to the, the, um, uh, the landfill. Um, not being utilized, we brought in, um, a developer was brought into the town. Um, he asked to build a 500,000 square foot fulfillment center there. Um, much like what you see on a lot of the corridor up and down the turnpike. Uh, that seems to be a great, great use for that area, especially today, which everything much is uh, dependent upon Amazon and, and uh, the, the internet age where people don't go to stores any longer. So there's a lot of opportunities for fulfillment centers along the turnpike where you could pick up store material and then get it to the, um, to the consumer. Uh, there they're looking to, to, to um, uh, utilize it as a pilot program um, and uh, get a tax break, which at the end of the day still brings more money back to the town than we had uh, in the condition that it is right now. Uh, in addition, he was asked to um, declare and pay for uh, all of the areas on Edgeboro Road up to and including uh, Motel 6 and the empty gas station uh, and the strip mall as air and, and the PNC Bank, that entire area, he was asked to pay to have that designated as an area in need of redevelopment so that we could actually talk to all of those owners about upgrading those properties because you're going to hear about all the work we want to do on the opposite side of the highway. But if we're going to do all that work there, um, we really have to be considering that the other side doesn't look so great either and it needs some help. Um, and through these opportunities through redevelopment, we don't want to leave them out. But we don't want to pay for it. So if the builder of this property wants a tax incentive, we want something back from the developer. And in order for him to have gotten the tax savings, um, he had to pay for that study and that designation. Still in the end, compared to the taxes he pays now, even with the pilot program, it's going to be bringing close to seven, dollars $800,000 extra in taxes to the town compared to what we were paying right now. So it's still a win for the town, and it doesn't change the nature of what that corridor over there already is, which is designated for 
industrial use. The second property, the one that was actually on the news um, just this week, is the 110 Tice's site. That's the area where the old Wonder Bread factory used to be. Um, again, that's an area that uh, at one previous time had a uh, purpose that uh, was needed, but as times have changed, uh, that business is out. A lot of the businesses that were there are leaving many of, for many different reasons, but it's, it, it was it last uh, had maybe three uh, people who were renting small space there. Uh, and the idea at the end is that, again, half a million dollars we were getting in taxes from that piece of property, and there's so many better uses uh, for that. The developer just wants to work with the town to try to figure out what those better uses are. Now, we're not listening to just the developer when we decide what the better uses are. That was the whole purpose behind putting together a redevelopment agency, hiring uh, individuals who specialize in planning and engineering and demographics and attorneys and individuals who actually studied the market and, and are able to help us figure out what the highest and best use of that property would be. Um, we're not putting another uh, industrial complex over there because we don't have the ability for truck traffic to handle the roads there. So it would, even though it's a great use, it's not the best use of that property. We're not putting single family homes there. That's not where most people want to live in single family homes. We're not putting another mall there. We're not going to put commercial space. When you drive around the town and you see commercial space for rent everywhere, that wouldn't be the highest and best use. The highest and best use, as we've been um, told from those people who are in this industry, is a mixed use type of community where you have some retail mixed with some residential component. And this particular um, uh, developer um, is willing to take um, 100 of those 115 units that have to be built in the redevelopment zone, or basically a third of our entire affordable housing obligation just in this development alone. There's 500 units that are going to be built there, 20% a 100. So 100 of our 300 is in this development alone. So I don't understand why people are so up in arms about putting a community here when it does serve us purpose. Um, and it helps us immensely. You can't leave it the way it is. If you put this type of community here, and the way it's, it's described, so let me help you uh, with this. Yeah, sure. The, um, to get your bearings on this, this is Tice's right here. The front over here would be where Dick's uh, Sporting Goods is located. Um, this entire property is about 25, 26 acres. In the development plans, as it's going to be changed, you could divide it almost into thirds. The first third that is the closest to Tice's Lane is going to be first floor retail with a little bit of a, uh, of a downtown type of look to it, and then apartments above it. Uh, the parking for these will be underground. Most of the parking here is going to be for the retail. The middle third is going to be mostly townhouses and duplex apartments. We're not sure yet, depending upon the market, whether that's going to be rental units or whether they will be for sale units. It depends on where the, the market goes, um, but we're flexible with that. A um, clubhouse, which would be primarily for the people that live there. And part of this deal with the developer is that in return for a tax incentive, he's deeding back to the town eight acres in the back of the property to the township for us to be used for a municipal purpose. That's exactly where we intend to put indoor ice skating rink. That's something that we have gone out to the public and asked many people what they would like as a public use. Um, and in addition, public ice skating rinks um, are uh, not that frequent, so there's not that many of them. The ice time is very hard to get, and almost all of them make money. So we would like to pump our money into a public project that actually helps us make money before we pump it into something that generally loses money, such as an indoor pool, which I know a lot of people would like, but, and we will get that at some point, but indoor pools generally do not generate the revenue that an ice skating rink will. And since this is the police um, target uh, range back here, all of this land in between is actually owned by the township. 
Um, and despite the fact that there's some wetlands in there, we would be willing to work with that should this be that successful that there could be room for a second rink. So that's the plan for the public purpose. As far as everybody complaining about traffic, please realize that we have taken traffic into consideration. The plan is this is Renee Road, which is the road that's right behind the Lake Apartments. Um, that would actually extend all the way into the complex that we're building on Route 18. Um, but for in, uh, individuals that would be interested in exiting Route 18, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of Eggers or Ruth Street, they would actually be able to take Renee Road, um, continue that all the way through this complex, and then what that does is take you out behind the Lowe's. Um, so it becomes a parallel road to Route 18 to help divert some of the traffic that tends to build up on Tice's over here where people are looking to make turns and, um, and it would divert some of the traffic in rush hour uh, at the, in the evening hour so that people could travel through these two communities, the one that's going to be on 18 and the one over here. Um, hopefully utilize some of the retail that's there, the restaurants, the nightlife, the shops, hopefully. Uh, but basically, the most congested portion of Route 18 is the section from Eggers to, um, to uh, Tice's. Um, probably could even say from the Turnpike exit to, uh, to, to um, Tice's. But if you could give people a parallel option of getting off of that road, it would help alleviate some of that traffic. Um, and I always say, uh, and I almost sound like a broken record, when retailers want to come into a community and they want to consider opening up a, a, a facility, a, a, a retail establishment, the first question they ask is what's the car count in the area that you're, um, they're looking to open up? Because if there's nobody there, there's the likelihood of doing well is very low. So having a good car count isn't a bad thing if you're really looking to attract better retail to this corridor. Uh, what we want is for the traffic to move through more efficiently, but you don't want to get rid of the main reason that any type of retail establishment would actually want to locate on Route 18. It's a huge corridor. You're dead center in the middle of the state at exit nine. You got the traffic from um, that takes us down to the shore. It's, a, it's a, one of the largest um, commercial corridors in the state. You don't want to lose that designation. You just want the traffic to move more efficiently. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about reducing that through the third bus station and parking deck that we're planning on putting here on Route 18. Again, a way of alleviating some of the, the stop and, st and start traffic that comes from um, the public transportation that goes up and down the corridor. This project is uh, demolition just started last week. It's going to take about a month for them to finish because that stuff has to also be carted out of the area. Uh, and then I believe we should be looking at some sort of uh, plan before our uh, township planning board, uh, either the end of the summer or beginning of the fall, and uh, looking at uh, at least the first phase of construction uh, this fall and, and into the spring. Who presently owns the property? Wilf. Well, it's garden homes, but it's uh, yeah, but it's yeah, wealth. Yeah, you always, yeah, you always have an estimate for the property. Okay. The last project, and that takes me to my pointer, is the Route 18 area. Most of everybody um, uh, who comes off of the Turnpike today uh, has that sunken face when they look at the Lomans that's out, and people think back to the times when we used to have that be the center of retail in East Brunswick. I remember the deli and the, and the stride right shoes for my kids, and, and, and you couldn't find a parking spot in those parking lots. And it was a place that if I listened to the news at night, people would be talking about retail on Route 18. People from all over the state came to Route 18. It's really sad in my eyes what's happened in the last 15 years or so, and it really has been about 15 years. Um, people say, oh, how could you possibly do anything? There's a dump back there, and I don't know. Uh, 15 years ago, people were coming from all over the state to shop there. You couldn't find a parking spot, and you know what? 
the landfill was there then too. So that's not the reason people aren't coming there. It's the reason it's not coming there is because it's been neglected. Um, it's the reason people aren't coming there is because people now shop online. There's no need for walking into physical establishments. And the design, the way it was designed, doesn't even work anymore. Who would, who would design a, a, a strip mall where in order to see what's there, you actually have to drive by it and look behind you? Like, it's the stupidest thing. I don't know how anybody even got away with that other than the fact that the retail was something that people uh, either knew about and knew how to get to and it became just the place to go to but you would never design it that way so we hired um, planners to try to establish for us what we thought the highest and best use of the properties um, so if you look at the traffic circle in the bottom of that slide um, this was our planners vision of what he thought this could look like, what type of features we would want to have there, what type of features would work compared to all other options. So again, looking out at Route 18, we're not putting a factory there. We're not going to turn it to parks, which I see people writing on, oh, I think we should turn it back to parks and buy it for open space. Are you kidding me? Do you think that the developer who owns this property, who is entitled to make money on his property, is going to want the town to purchase it? And we would even want to do that. So we're going to take a loan out to turn it into park space and get no income. It doesn't even make sense to me. So there's a lot, 11 different parks in the town. We have lots of spaces in our town that people could utilize parks. We're not turning Route 18 into a park. So. The, the suggestion is out there, it's ridiculous. Um, we're not putting commercial space there. We're not going to be putting um, another mall there. Look at what's gone on with the Brunswick Square Mall. It's taking a long time for the person to put a lot of money and effort into trying to turn that around. It's just not feasible. So again, most studies have shown that the highest and best use, the thing that will return to the town, the largest return to our rateable tax base is a combination of mixed-use space and another parking deck. Right now there's a three-year wait to get into our two parking decks, the one that we have by uh, the uh, Tower Center and the one that we have by Walmart. We don't even take people and put them on the list anymore. It's actually embarrassing because the odds of ever getting a spot at this point with a three-year wait is virtually un un so unlikely that we're not even taking names any longer and um, and of course we have one of the busiest bus routes in in all of New Jersey if you compare our bus routes to New Jersey transit the largest and the busiest transit line is the Northeast corridor if you look at different stops on the Northeast corridor we rank with our bus volume at around the fourth or fifth busiest stop um, if you compared it to the Northeast Corridor. So it's an incredibly busy corridor, and which is a good thing for us. But the reality is that there's no parking. Um, what we have right now are people on waiting lists. If they don't want to do the $5 a day parking, what they end up doing is they park all along the side streets. They park on Ruth Street, they park on the by the Taylor Apartments, and they basically cross Route 18 and congregate Every morning, about 250 people, we've counted them at the FedEx building, and they wait for the buses. And the buses come every couple of minutes, and there's no bus lane, so they just stop on the highway, and traffic just backs up right behind them. And the same thing happens in the opposite direction in the evening. So with a third station, we will hopefully get some of those people who are looking for spots um, an opportunity, any type of retail that would go into this space would need parking. Um, and, it'll, and, and it allows a bus station so that we can get those buses off of the road so that cars can travel more efficiently through the, through, the, through the highway and not bottleneck every morning and contribute to the traffic that we see in the morning on the southbound side, northbound side and southbound side in the evening. Again, if you looked at uh, his rendition version of what we could do, 
Um, again, mixed use with apartments at the top, retail on the bottom, outdoor space, space to have um, community purposes, outdoor theater perhaps, um, outdoor markets, so trying to make a sense of a walkable, transit-oriented type of community. That would be what would work best. And so what they did was they put together our planner, a plan of what he'd like to see a developer put into his uh, bid, and we went out to bid. And we had different developers bid on how they would be able to develop that property. And we had about four people who put in different bids. And at the end of the day, we felt that one more than any of the others met the closest to the type of things we wanted to see in that area. It didn't have to look just like that. It just had to have the ability to incorporate all of those features into the plan. So the person who was uh, awarded the plan, that was back in March, had to do specific requirements. They had to create a town center, had to have uh, something that brought more money to our tax base. It is, we're not doing this to lose money the way, way we are if it stays the way it is. Um, we wanted something that would create jobs, generate a buzz, have a bit of a transit-oriented type of development. Um, we wanted to make sure that there were amenities that came back to the township. So again, we spoke about some of those things on Facebook as to what we would do with some of the um, municipal portions. People in the town had different opinions about what we should do with the municipal portion that was being set aside. But that was one tiny piece of a much bigger puzzle. And you'll see that what the developer came up with was a um, more unique type of plan than our own planner himself. And so what you look and can see in that picture is Route 18 at the top, traffic circle you could see towards the right. I gotta figure out how to do the pointer. Well, I guess the laser's not working. The brown areas are all um, apartments with retail on the first floor. The retail in the new area is going to be less square footage than the retail that's there right now. Right now, there's about, I think, 400,000 square feet of retail space. We all know that it's very difficult for retail to work today because of everything moving online. The developer here is looking to build about 100,000 square foot of retail. Um, and, and, and if that were to be successful, that could be made bigger. In the right left lower corner, I'm sorry, the left lower corner is the tennis club. We saw no reason for that to leave, that if there's going to be people living in this community, that actually may enhance that use. Um, and so there was no reason for her to leave. That actually worked. Um, there's a restaurant up at the top that overlooks a water feature. Um, goal would to be bring a different um, diverse type of restaurants uh, to the town. The town is sitting on a liquor license right now that it could sell. And if everything's in one building, that liquor license could be shared, much like they do in Atlantic City. And um, to the right, upper right corner is a, uh, their version of a hotel or conference center. And that connects to a middle piece there, which would be a, uh, the bus station and parking deck. And above that was space that was set aside for municipal purposes. What we do with that purpose, about 40,000 square feet of municipal purpose, we do not need to decide. Earlier, a couple months ago, we had a whole hullabaloo over moving a library there, rather than people thought the senior center was moving there. We're not, it's a town decision what you're gonna do with that public space. But you could see there's a big plan here and what we do with that municipal space does not need to be decided this minute. You could put a whole up indoor pool up there or a theater. I, I don't really care what we do. We could rent it out and, and make money on it. it. There's a lot of options for what we do with that municipal space. But I just don't want individuals festering over what we're doing with the municipal space when there's a 35 acres of plans out there that we want to make sure meets the town's needs. I don't want anybody getting married to this picture. It doesn't have to look like this. Buildings could be moved into different spots. And in fact, as we've been working with the developer, there is the likelihood that we will move some of the buildings from one spot to another. But you could see that there's a, an 
effort and attempt at trying to make it unique and a little bit different in its architecture and appearance, that there's a lot of detail into the outdoor space and the green space. There's detail into making sure that we have the parking deck and that that parking deck gets easy access to Route 18 so that buses can get back out onto the turnpike very quickly. Um, hotels, a hotel with over 100 bedrooms brings the town another liquor license. Um, hotels today could double as we work spaces and shared office spaces. Hotels could be used for incubators. We have a university right in our backyard. So maybe that's something that we can consider with um, the hotel or our municipal space using it or sharing it with some of the universities. These are all nothing that's been decided. These are all ideas that are out there. And I think that the concept of what we want to employ in here, what we want to see this turn into, is really mirrored after what, um, what the um, uh, focus is in New Brunswick. If anybody's been studying uh, development in New Brunswick, they're concentrating on three key areas. They're concentrating on the arts, uh, which is why you see the George Street Theater going up, a very big effort at making it an art center of New Jersey. They're concentrating on IT, knowing that they have the university in their backyard, and they're concentrated on medical because they've got two hospitals in New Brunswick. Um, but New Brunswick, like I've said before, has its own problems. It's a landlocked, small city, and you can't park to save your life. And if you want to drive in and out of New Brunswick, anytime there's school in session, um, it's impossible to get in and out of there. I know that with certainty because I tell my office, don't ever schedule me anything for surgery after 10 o'clock. Because once you're after 10 o'clock or noon at the latest, um, I'm stuck there. I, you cannot get in and out of New Brunswick. If I got surgery, I'm early in the morning and I'm out of there because you just can't move. But in this community, there's no reason we should try to compete with New Brunswick. Um, we could feature medical. A lot of the office space that's going to be in there is going to be devoted to uh, sports medicine, physical therapy, physician space. A lot of hospitals right now are going out and buying up small practices. I know that because mine was purchased. And many, like my colleagues, are in that same boat where they don't want to uh, work for um, themselves, it's, it's not economically feasible any longer. And so a lot of hospitals are buying up practices. And after they get a certain number of practices, it makes sense to try to combine them into bigger space. Um, so that's a, 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 and we also have a corridor right on Cranberry Road that's loaded with doctors. It's been dubbed um, Doctors Row. Uh, no reason why we can't be taking advantage of what we already have here. IT, we have uh, the three main fields, professional fields of people that work in East Brunswick are um, medical, IT, and financial. Uh, no reason why we can't be uh, using this for, um, uh, for IT and technical capabilities and space and that could be offered to individuals for that purpose. And of course, no reason why we shouldn't be trying to feature um, the arts. We were, we were making a big push to increase the arts in East Brunswick. We have a lot of talented people that are here. Schools have made a huge investment, have done it for decades in the arts. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be trying to capitalize on the things that we already have here um, out on, on, on the highway and why that shouldn't be incorporated into that plan. Um, as far as this goes in terms of where we are right now, we are working with that developer to come up with a redevelopment um, plan and agreement. Um, if that gets signed, then um, we are ready to uh, start um, accumulating and taking property and being able to turn it over to the developer to actually do these projects. Uh, some of the land has already been purchased. Uh, we've already purchased the piece by old David's Bridles and the properties that are next to it. The town already owns that. Um, what the town does not want to do is to accumulate properties and become landowners. That is not our intention. Our intention is to utilize whatever possible means we have through redevelopment. If it includes taking property, we will, um, and turning it over to the developer to get these projects off the ground. The town does not want to be holding property um, and paying notes and uh, debt uh, uh, and becoming landowners. That's, that's not our intention. So once we have an agreement with our uh, developer, uh, then the goal would be for them to acquire the property. Whether we 
help them do that or they do it on their own, doesn't matter uh, to us as long as, the prop as these buildings uh, and the area starts getting built. What would go up first? Most likely, um, the, the, the parking deck and the bus depot um, would be one of the first things to go up. Uh, you need to prove to, to the developers that we're serious about what we're doing. And since that's something that the town would own, we own the other two, we would want to own this one. Um, you could also probably portion off uh, a third of that cost to the hotel because the hotel would need parking. So that would be an income stream to us uh, on that utility that we would own. Um, that would be one of the first things to go up. Hotel would probably go up fairly quickly. And, um, and then over time, we would start to fill in uh, the rest based on where the market goes. Our goal is to start as soon as we have an agreement. Um, to then, once that's signed, to, uh, to, uh, to move towards uh, acquiring the properties and then building, um, hopefully, by the beginning of the building season next year. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you all coming out. I, uh, I was getting scared in the beginning. There was like one or two people here. I thought that uh, no one was interested, but uh, it's a testament to everyone that lives here that they want to be participating, and that's the role that I feel is my responsibility is to make sure that we have these type of discussions and we uh, get out uh, all the information in the a format that everybody can understand. And so I, I just thank you all for, for, uh, for coming. And um, we will have more of them. So as we get more information, I will give you what we have. So thank you. <laughs>